Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Tigor Miani. I'm talking from the NGO branch at the United Nations in New York. Uh, first of all, before I, I begin, I want to make sure that everybody can listen to me okay. Um, and there are some people that from time to time uh, we can listen to them. Uh, it's very important that everybody uh, keep their uh, microphone off. Uh, so always keep the microphone off. At some point later in the webinar, we'll, you'll have the time to the chance to speak. So because if you start speaking, then the, the voice will be confused with my voice, and then it will be, you know, people will not be able to, to listen to me. So please, for the next 30 minutes or so, I'll appreciate if you keep the mic off, and then we'll, from that moment we will explain how to give the floor to everybody. So welcome again, uh, and thank you, thank you very much for everybody to, for joining us here in the morning in New York, and we know that we have people from all over the world, and that's, that's great. We really want participants from everywhere and applicants from everywhere to, that are interested in the possibility to apply and to eventually work with ECOSOC. Uh, my name, as I said, is Diego Rumiani. I work here in the NGO branch, which is part of the uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations. And, uh, and this presentation that I'm going to give is, is about, it's going to take about 30 minutes. So after that presentation, um, you will be able to interact uh, in the way of asking questions, either by taking the floor or in writing. Uh, questions can be written in writing at any time. So you have a way to access your chat and you can send a message in the chat to the NGO branch, the user NGO branch, who will be compiling all your questions. And then after the 30 minutes, I'll be going through uh, some of the questions. We will probably not have time to, to pick up all the questions, but I'll try to make a good selection of questions so we cover m most of the common issues and problems and, and, and doubts in, in applying for consultative status uh, with ECOSOC. So I'll, I'll appreciate you can start writing from now on. Uh, again, please don't take the floor. Don't uh, turn on your mic because that will be that will be problematic for the communication. Uh, so let's let's start. The presentation will will imply basically uh, three areas. The first area I will very quickly go through what is consultative status, which I'm sure many of you already know about it because you already express interest. In, 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 in applying, uh, or you are already applying, uh, or in the process of, of finishing your application. So we're going to talk a little bit about what consultative status is, uh, which organizations are eligible for it, and most important than anything else is what are the benefits, why you should apply for consultative status. The second part will be a little bit more technical into the application process. Uh, so we'll explain the process from the moment of applying uh, from consultative status, from submitting your application all the way until your application is reviewed first here in the NGO branch and ultimately in the Committee on NGOs, which is part of ECOSOC and in ECOSOC itself. So after that, we will, we will, be, uh, we will be covering the whole process of your application. Finally, the third part of this, this process is uh, the main components of the application package. Uh, so, uh, uh, sorry, I, is, is it okay? You listen to me okay? Yeah. So the, the application process of, of, uh, of the application package, all the components, uh, we're going to go through uh, most of them. I mean, we're not going to go question by question, but just to be aware of what are the things you have to look for in filling out the questionnaire, uh, looking a little bit at how to do it online, and, and it's not going to be a step-by-step -step, uh, 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 process of how to do every single thing, but we'll go from, for the most common issues that you're going to find in filling out the questionnaire. Okay, so that's the plan for, for today, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll start. So the first question is, what is consultative status, which is the reason why I guess uh, most of you are here. And consultative status is a relationship that was established, uh, uh, you know, it existed in different names and fashion before 1990, 1996, but in 1996 it was established 
has a specific relationship between the Economic and Social Council, which is one of the bodies of the United Nations dealing, uh, with the main body dealing with economic and social affairs, and particularly now as part of the development agenda for, with the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, and NGO, civil society around the world. This association uh, became formal in 1996, and it's still the same procedure we use it uh, since then. Uh, and right now we have uh, about 4,500 4, approximately NGOs that are currently in consultative status with ECOSOC, which is, a, as you can see, a large number. And, as, as, and this number is continuously increased because there is a, a lot of interest in, in getting more and more involved with the work of, of ECOSOC, uh, either through the commissions that ECOSOC celebrate in the first half of the year or, or the plenary meetings even uh, that happened during the first, the first uh, um, mostly in July, but also there are some in April and May and, and in, in other moments in the year. Uh, so that's, that's basically this consultative relationship. And in consultative relation, the most important thing you have to get from it is not really an association that you just subscribe to any type of uh, publication or information you get from the UN but it's really a call for participate. You know, we, the, the ECOSOC needs NGO to get involved in the implementation of the SDGs and in, in the big development agenda uh, plan of the United Nations. So that's why there is a lot of opportunities for NGOs to get involved in the work of the UN and to have a voice in the work of the UN. Uh, and to attend meetings and, and you know many ways of participating. So what are, what are the benefits? You know one of the first things before even opening the application for you to think is what I'm going to be contributing. What are the things that I'm going to get out of the out of this association? Well, I like to separate this between two areas. One is the formal, more formal one, and the other more informal. The formal are all established in one uh, resolution that are is called ECOSOC Resolution 1996/31, and this resolution regulates all the all this relationship between civil society and and and, uh, and the UN and ECOSOC in particular. Uh, the formal participation, the, the main participation is as soon as you get consultative status, you are given a ground pass to attend UN meetings. Uh, in uh, definitely in all the areas in which ECOSOC, in all the parts of the world where ECOSOC has uh, meetings, which is mostly in Geneva, New York, and Vienna, but also in other offices around the world. Uh, and, and with that you can basically attend all meetings of ECOSOC, which otherwise uh, not any other NGO will be able to attend or any other entity. Only entities that are, have this type of association with, with ECOSOC will be able to attend uh, to this meeting. So this ground pass is very valuable. Uh, but also it's not only attending meetings, but also participating in meetings. And participating in meetings will allow you to either write statements that, that can be presented to the ECOSOC and be part of the, of the compendium of, of all the participation of that meeting, so it will have an official value in UN deliberations. And also speaking at ECOSOC, many commissions and more and more are having chances to allow NGOs to participate, is, uh, to, to speak, you know. Um, there are many NGOs, as you can imagine, 4,500, it's a large number, so not all of them can speak. But in some commissions, many, many NGOs manage to, to speak, and this is also very valuable, it's something NGOs tend to appreciate uh, a lot, uh, because they allow us to share their experiences share their view, which is what basically the UN is looking forward behind this association, is, is to hear the voices of NGOs uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this information. Uh, the other ways of participating are more informal, but sometimes equally or even more valuable. Uh, being in the UN and being in this deliberation for some NGOs allow us to interact with uh, other civil society members, but also uh, government officials, delegations that are present in, 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 uh, in the UN, uh, and UN officials who are actually uh, members of different of the entities of the UN family. Uh, so this interaction could enable them to, to really have an, an, an interaction to, 
to share their projects, to even you know come up with with new partnerships that that usually come up from this this interaction. That's very important and uh, for NGOs. The other thing uh, that you can do is organize uh, what we call side events. So in the context of uh, many of the commissions, uh, many commissions even call for or, for NGOs to work and prepare meetings uh, that they will be chairing to share their project or to discuss a particular topic of the of the agenda of that commission. And and this is very very popular. Uh, Commission Status of Women, Commission on Social Development, um, the Forum of Indigenous Issues. Many of these, many of these uh, commissions of ECOSOC attracts a large number of NGOs, and these NGOs usually have the chance to speak. So this is this is uh, really really very very important. So these are some of the benefits, uh, and and of course the interaction and, and the possibility to to go around the UN is always very valuable for for many NGOs and and you know that's something you have to take into consideration uh, after you get your consultant status also to plan what is really what you want to get out of the out of this association uh, so let's talk about the application process now uh, the application process uh, many of you I imagine already submitted the application or they are in the process of submitting some of you maybe are considering it and and this webinar uh, uh, hopefully the idea is to make up your mind of whether this is really uh, for your NGO this is your you're really interested or already uh, to apply so the process uh, uh, the applications are received throughout the year so um, any you can submit an application at any time uh, However, we have this June 1st deadline, which we are announcing and, and advertising everywhere to make sure NGOs really know that the June 1st deadline is important. Now, why is it important? Why we put a deadline of June 1st? Well, even though we accept applications throughout the year, uh, the June 1st deadline is, is important because only applications submitted before this June 1st, or by this June 1st, actually, uh, will be evaluated by the committee during the 2018 session. So that means next year. Uh, all, all applications submitted after June 1st, you know, so from June 1st, 20, this June 1st, 2017 until June 1st, 2018, they are going to be evaluated already in the 2019 session. Uh, so it's very important uh, to submit it in, in terms of the timing. Uh, not in terms of opportunity or in terms of anything else, but it's in terms of timing. If you want to get your consult status uh, as early as possible, to do it before this June 1st. Um, and in, in that we are working to make sure everybody who submits their application can be moved to the committee and, and get their status as soon as possible. Uh, so let's, let's see what is the, 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 the path that these applications follow since their application. So, uh, let's say uh, I'm an NGO and I apply right now. I submit an application right now. So I, I fulfill all requirements and we're going to uh, talk a little bit about this. Uh, and I decide to submit an application. I complete the application form. I submit all the documents and, and I, I submit it today, uh, May 5th at least, uh, here in New York. So the application will be first reviewed by the NGO branch and we basically do a technical review in which we look at what is missing, what other elements are, are confusing or we need further clarifications, this type of uh, evaluation and we're going to be contacting with you. All the communication is done um, electronically. Um, we have a messaging system for which we, we communicate and I'm sure some of you are already using it. Uh, so please, this is the, the, the place where we're going to be communicating with you and eventually after this back and forth when we feel your application is ready to go uh, we submit it to the NGO committee. Now this NGO committee we already met, I, I mentioned it many many times uh, it's a committee that is part of ECOSOC so it's one of the commissions of subsidiary, subsidiary uh, bodies of, uh, of ECOSOC and it meets twice a year. It meets in January, it meets in May. Uh, of course, the, the earliest you can get there, the better, but this is also has to do with the number of applications we receive every year, and we do receive a lot. Like last year, we got uh, more than 700 applications. So it's a, 
We, this year we don't know, until June 1st we cannot tell, but we are foreseeing even a bigger number than that. Uh, so, uh, so based on the number we try to allocate up, uh, applicants uh, into the January and the May session. So when the applicant, the application go to the committee, uh, the committee is composed of uh, 19 member states uh, and a chair who usually is a member of one of these member states uh, and they basically they go one by one, they look at the applications uh, and they ask questions to the NGO. So if I'm the chair, I'm going to consider application of the organization X, Y and Z and they're going to say, okay, um, you know, we have the application here anybody has any question about this application and if nobody has any question which is hopefully the best case a scenario means your application is clear they know what you do they really understand all the documentation then you are recommended for consultative status that's the first step in getting consultative status so you don't get consultative status in that january or may session but you are recommended uh, for for getting a consultative status uh, so this recommendation is very important, it's basically one step before getting it. And the reason why you get recommended is because the committee on NGOs cannot make that decision. You know, the, the committee on NGO uh, is a committee, but is the plenary, all the composition, the full composition of ECOSOC, who will be making that decision. And that will happen either in April, if you were submitted in the January Commission, in the January Committee, or in May, if you were submitted in the, um, in the, sorry, in July, if you were submitted in the May committee. So that means that if I apply right now, the earliest I can get consultative status, and this is usually a question I usually receive, how, what is the, you know, assuming everything goes smooth, what is the earliest I can get consultative status, will be April. So if your application get to January, and January goes well, then April will be the, the the earliest date in which April I'm talking about, obviously next year, will be the date in which you will be, the, the moment in which you will get consultative status, you will be granted consultative status. At that moment, you have all the full privileges I, I was mentioning before, ground passes, possibility to speak, submit written statement, participate in, in, in meetings, uh, organize eventually meetings. Uh, you know all this, all this work you can do on, uh, with, with the UN, and particularly with ECOSOC. Uh, um, so the so that's that's I, I first do the best case scenario, but unfortunately, for some NGOs, things are getting a little bit more difficult, and committee usually ask questions to NGOs, and and, and these questions uh, you will get will be during the meeting transmitted to you, so. You're invited to attend the meeting, but it's really not uh, necessary. I mean, it's, it's uh, because in some cases it implies uh, traveling to, to New York. The committee is always held in New York. Uh, so we really uh, not encouraging NGOs to really travel specifically for the meeting. Of course, if you can do it, you're welcome to do it. And we, we really make sure of uh, getting the ground passes uh, in the UN to, to get into the meeting. But it's not really necessary. and. The whole process of, of, uh, of uh, if you get any question, these questions will be transmitted to you electronically, even, even if you are here. Uh, so this back and forth with the committee uh, is, is, you know, the committee meets for around eight, uh, seven, seven to eight days. So this back and forth with the committee uh, may take a while. And if the committee cannot make a decision with information you received during that period, then what, what happens is what we call a deferment of your case. So your application is deferred to, another, to the next session. So if you, let's say, got in January, you got a question, you answer, maybe you got another question, the committee don't have more time to consider your case because of this time limitation, your case will be deferred automatically to May. And in May, the same thing will happen, you know, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, we want your cases to to get a consultative status soon, but if the delegations have uh, have questions, they can keep deferring your cases. So that's very important for you to be on top of your case, not only after you submit it and, and in our interaction with the NGO branch, but more important in the interaction with the NGO committee, because they are the ones who ultimately will decide to recommend you or not. Um, so so that's that's very important in terms of of uh, of handling deferments in the in the NGO committee. 
Um, okay, so the last aspect I want to talk in terms of the, the application process uh, is the components, what you have to submit. Uh, and one aspect is the eligibility. So, um, 1996-31 is pretty wide in terms of which NGOs can can be accepted. Actually, there is no much uh, uh, definition. So we really accept a large number of uh, type of NGOs or type of organizations. I'm not going to talk about the specific types. If you have any question about your organization, and maybe you know we can address it here. Uh, but uh, always you can write to us uh, through this uh, messaging system, which by the way you can access by going to the NGO branch website and clicking on contact us and there you can ask any questions that come up from this webinar or any other question you may think about the process but the eligibility is, is, is very is very open the only thing that I would say is, is very important is that your organization has been in existence for two years uh, this is this is something that there's no way to overcome if you're going if you just created your organization or even last year and uh, we will be asking you to prove that your organization is more than two years and for that we will ask for governmental documentation uh, and if we are not able to prove unfortunately we are not able to process your application at least at this moment you will be able to reapply later and, and when you are eligible but but this is a very if you want a strong requirement in terms of uh, organizations. There are other requirements and uh, they are written in the in, in our website. I'm not going to go one by one, but you know, having a democratic constitution, having a financial statement or financial records that we can evaluate, um, etc. You know, there are many, many other elements, but the two years is, is, is very important and we put this very much in advance because some NGOs, you know, they just uh, were created and and they heard about this possibility and, and they apply and unfortunately we we need to we cannot allow them to to move forward so so that's uh, something for you to 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 be aware of um, so for the rest uh, for the rest I'm gonna go basically I'm gonna uh, share a little bit of the website and, and see a little bit you know, we're going to do some kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, way. Uh, so let's see. I'm basically going to share the web browser I have here. Okay, so hopefully you will be seeing here my browser. And I'm checking with my colleagues to see if they you can see my browser. Thank you. Okay, it's okay now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So here we are going to the Angel Branch website, and here you can see. Uh, many of you probably came here, many of you actually had to register to this webinar through here, so hopefully I'm not saying something you never saw before. Um, one important thing for questions and, and, and about anything of this webinar or the application process in general, uh, I'm going to quickly show you, please go to this option, contact us, question, contact us, and this link that I'm highlighting here, follow this link to ask us a question now, will give you the steps to send us a question. And we try to answer, as you can imagine, with 700 applicants, it's a lot of people uh, consulting uh, issues and, and sharing uh, different uh, concerns. We'll try to respond as much as possible. Please send all your questions to the application for consultative status category. So when you come here, you will see a place where you have to select a category. Please select application for consultative status. We have other issues, the, the, our branch, a lot of administrative expenditures you want to do an effort to associate everything to projects. Uh, this is, this is uh, very important because you don't want the NGO to, to look like it's only doing administrative stuff, otherwise you're going to get a question. You're going to get a question from the committee members about that. So again, there are many hints uh, about this. I'll recommend you to visit them. You can see the one we put here, which more detail explain what I'm saying. Uh, 
please be aware of this when, when deciding what numbers to put. Numbers are very important. These are, are difficult to explain because you just put a number and that's it. Any clarification about numbers, we strongly encourage NGOs to put it right down here. Uh, and write as many as you need because committee members will look at it and understand some of the numbers thanks to your explanation. So this is also a good place to, to, really, to really explain things in terms of financial information. Finally, and, and with this I will conclude the, this presentation, uh, we have the document section. And the document section are the three required documents that you require to present. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. So the first uh, document you have to present is, um, it says here, certificate of registration, but it's actually uh, a proof of existence that it has to be issued by a governmental authority that proves that your organization has been in existence for these two years for, uh, uh, in, in, in the country or, or whatever the, the, the document is certifying. Uh, there are many uh, questions about the issue of the proof of existence. I'm not going to cover all of them because, you know, there is very much. Uh, we are welcome to ask questions here in, in, if, if there is no time later in your particular case. But in cases, for instance, a common case that we receive is NGOs that don't have any type of registration with their countries and therefore they don't have any proof of existence. Uh, they need to secure some kind of proof of existence, which usually is, uh, in many countries, NGOs are tax exempt. So this tax exemption, which is uh, usually obtained from the tax authority, it's a good, uh, it's a good, it's a good element. It's a good. Uh, uh, document because it is issued by the government. Uh, so, but it, the, the requirement is that it has to be issued by a governmental authority. Um, there are other cases as well. Uh, the document has to be presented the original, um, and if this original is not either in English or French, as you may know, we accept applications in English and French. Unfortunately, these are the working language of the UN, and unfortunately, the other uh, languages or the official languages are, are not accepted but English and French, and this document has to be have a translation, if it's not in English or French, into English or French. Uh, the Constitution has to, uh, and, and it sometimes in some countries it's called by laws or statutes or charter, uh, we don't care so much about the name it has, we care about what it contains, and we want to have a very clear explanation of a governance structure and the decision-making process. Usually these documents follow a standard format, but of course this can change from country to country, uh, and this standard format contains that information. But if it's, you're not following a standard format, and if it contains that information, we accept it anyway. Uh, similarly, if this document, uh, we don't need the original of this document, so as long as you give us a copy either translated or the original in English and French, we are fine. Finally, the financial statement. And the financial statement we want, uh, financial statement is basically uh, some NGOs have to generate it for third parties or donors. So if you have that documentation already, you just have to pick that. Uh, it has to be a recent financial statement. We, we request two years before the, the moment in which you apply. And the financial statement has to have um, uh, at least an income, ex an income ex statement and a balance sheet. That's, those are the two elements uh, that we, we require for the financial statement. And just as like the Constitution, we need the, 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 sorry, the element of um, uh, the English or French. Could be a translation, doesn't need to be original, uh, but we need it to have it in English or French. So remember, all this documentation and the application form has to be in English or French so delegations can process because this is the the working language of the United Nations. Um, okay, so with this, I conclude a really fast, but I hope comprehensive nonetheless, uh, review of the process of applying, of what is consultative status, and also on the components of things that you really have to put your hands on to submit, and many of you, I know, are already submitting. I ask in writing. Okay, and I'll, I'll try to answer, I'll try to mix, I, I want also to hear you, uh, I don't want to be the only one talking here, 
and, and uh, I'll mix with what you have. And uh, at this moment, if you want to speak, uh, you have a button, say, raise your hand. Uh, again, we cannot promise you're many over there, but we cannot promise all of you will be speaking. We, we, we pick totally randomly. Uh, and, and hopefully, please, if I read your question, I appreciate you lower your hand or don't raise it. Uh, so we allow other people to, to, to speak. So let me see what we have here. Um, okay. Just let me... Okay, so let me see. Okay, so here we have a question uh, about ECOSOC status and to change it from roster to general or special. Um, um, let me tell you a little bit about that for the ones you don't know. There are three types of consultative status, and this consultative status, this type is decided by the committee. Uh, and to say it, to say it quickly, uh, ECOSOC uh, the, the committee decides based on your organization which status to give you. Quickly, roster, uh, special status is the most common one out of the 4,500, I don't know, maybe 3,000 have special consultative status, uh, maybe even more. Uh, and, and basically it's for NGOs that are working on a particular area of the work of ECOSOC, on one specific area usually, you know, education, health, um, you know, you name it. But, but one particular, one particular area and they have a narrow coverage, usually a country, maybe two countries, but not a global coverage. Uh, general status is for NGOs who do have a global coverage, and also usually they work on many areas of ECOSOC. Uh, so they may work on uh, health, but also they do things on education, they do things on, on, uh, on uh, 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 you know, on, on other issues. Uh, so this this type of uh, this type of NGOs are it's a limited group. Uh, you we probably have around 200, no more than that. And usually these are big NGOs established uh, at a global level. And, and you know if you go and search in our database for NGOs with general consultative status, you will find many familiar names because these are NGOs that are usually well known. Uh, roster is a classification uh, that is NGOs who have no Intra, no uh, direct relevance usually to, to ECOSOC or at least they were given status in, for that for uh, any way even though they are not totally related to ECOSOC. Uh, there are other type of roster status but I don't want to get some detail into it. But these NGOs, ECOSOC wants them in because eventually their participation could be useful. They want them to participate in some form because they usually have some specific or technical uh, expertise that, that could be useful to the work of ECOSOC. So, uh, so those are roster. The process to apply to, to move from roster to general special is, 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 uh, is not that easy because you have to submit another application. So this is for people who are already in one of these categories. Uh, there is an option when you go to submit an application um, that is a, it says submit a red classification. So it's actually in the same uh, in the same uh, system. I'm not going to go through it now because we really don't receive so many of those. But if you have a particular issue, you can try to you can submit it right now. You don't need our permission or anything for us to do. Uh, but uh, but you can uh, definitely submit it, or you can write and we provide instructions on how to do it in detail uh, for your particular case. If you if this is what you wish to do. This, of course, just as any other application, will be reviewed by us, will go to the committee, and will be either uh, recommended or deferred, depending on if there are questions or the committee consider that, you know, the status you aspire to, you are not really uh, ready for that, or you are not uh, fulfilled the, the eligibility for that. Uh, okay, so let me see other questions here. Uh, so to... Uh, let me see. Okay, I have a question here that says if you would like to know whether it's in, impossible to fill in the application during a certain period, like a week, and go back to already filled in sections. Uh, yes, you can start the application, stop it, do something else, you can keep it there if you want forever. You can always come back and complete it. 
uh, just make sure it's saved. Uh, the, uh, the screens have a timeout, I think right now, of, I don't remember that exactly, but I think it's 10 to 20 minutes. So if you don't do anything and you didn't save for 10 or 20 minutes, then yes, you're going to lose that. But just, you know, be, be, be sure to save from time to time. And yes, you can complete it. As long as the application is not submitted, you can always uh, uh, complete the application. You can always uh, continue working on it. Okay, let me see another question and then I'll, I'll go to the floor. Uh, let me see. Okay, so okay, so I'll move to another question. I'm reading here. Okay, here I have several questions. So, the first question: If the is it compulsory for accreditation to be mainly funded through public, private funds and sector? We kind of address that by saying you can be funded by the government partially, or uh, uh, you can be funded by other sources. The only thing, and even funding from private sector, you have to, the, the issue of funding is always independence. You always want to be sure that the funding, you always want to, uh, be, uh, let me see, yeah, you always have to be funded uh, by actually any type of organization as long as you prove the independency from that, that organization. Because one of the things uh, that, that committees aware is that the NGO is independent. So if you're funded from the private sector, uh, you can also be dependent on the private sector and that's something you would like to justify, especially if it is a lot of uh, a, a, a big amount of money that you're receiving from the funding sector. Uh, so there is no compulsion. You can write really whatever you want in terms of the funding, but you just have to be aware of the justifications you have to make because otherwise you'll get a question from the committee and that question from the committee will actually create uh, delays in your application. You don't really want questions. That's, that's basically the goal in, in your application. You have to anticipate to these questions. Uh, there is questions about foundations, uh, if they can have accreditation, the answer is yes, there is no restriction in 1996-31, so uh, there is no, no, no problem. Uh, again, if these foundations are funded completely from private funds or a private company, for instance, from the private sector, well, you need to justify a little bit there what's, uh, what's the problem, you know, what, what, what could be the problem, that you are independent, that the objectives of the private company, which is always a for-profit objective, uh, is not, uh, doesn't influence the, the decision-making process of your organization. Uh, okay, then let me see the last one, and I'll go to... to okay, the translation, if they have to be official. Uh, so, translations uh, don't have to be official. So, all translations, you can do it yourself if you, if you want. I know tr uh, translation usually takes time and takes money if you make it official, and basically this is a process that we don't, you know, we don't charge for this process. It should be totally free. Uh, uh, I mean, it's not free because, you know, it takes time, but, but at least you don't have to have extra expenditures to carry on this project. So, uh, translation don't have to be official, uh, and you can do the translation yourself or someone uh, who is really not an official translator. Okay, so I'll switch now to see if someone wants to take the floor. and Maybe I can, let me see, I see several people here. So I'm gonna pick, okay, I see someone with the name I'm asking my colleagues here to give them the floor. Erica. And again. Let me see. Okay. Okay. Erica, you, you have the floor. Oh. 
<laughs> sorry, sorry, I was without without mic. Okay. Danny. Let me repeat the question, see if I get it. So if you say if the fact of working with other NGOs could be helpful, right? In terms of having already created um, statements and interventions. And right. Well, um, it, it's hard to say. I mean, it's it depends on the, the, in, the, the, how can I put it, the reference that committee members who are going to be judging your application is depending on this. Uh, on, on the reference they have about this NGO, whether this is going to be beneficial or not. So it's of course good that you show that you already been either working with these NGOs and, and these NGOs working with the UN because it shows that you have familiarity with the UN processes and you already are involved in the processes, in, 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 in the work of, of ECOSOC. However, you have to be aware that usually they're going to evaluate any name of any entity uh, that you put in your application is part of your evaluation. So if a particular country didn't have a good experience or doesn't have a good opinion about that NGO, uh, this will, uh, this may or may not affect you. So this is something you have to do. Now if you do it and you put it in your website and you you you, you are advertising anywhere, of course it's something you cannot you know, not put it because it's, 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 it's public. Just be aware that this is the consequence. So if you want to work, my, my advice is if you're going to uh, establish uh, or, or disclose this relationship, uh, do it, but put exactly what kind of relationship you have and what are the limitations of, of this relation. Like you work with them, but on this particular project or for this particular objective. Uh, this is something part of, of what you have to think about uh, your convenience. But uh, in terms of working with the UN, yes, um, committee members like to see that you are already uh, involved. Uh, with the UN and you already know, you're going to get consultative status and you know what to do, you, you already have a plan. That's uh, answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. No problem, thank you. Okay, I'm going to take uh, someone else. Uh, again, please, the ones who are raising the hand is probably not, uh, expect another ones I just answered. So if you did it and maybe you forgot, just lower it. Okay, I'm going to get John Providence. And I'm asking my colleagues to John mm -hmm. Providence. And I'm asking my colleagues to give the floor. Okay, you have the floor, John. You have the floor. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think he left. <laughs> uh, okay, so we go now to let me try someone else. Lorena Morales Vidal. You have the floor now. Uh, I was wondering about which are the obligations for the NGOs that get the status. Sorry, can you repeat that question you want to know about? What are the obligations uh, for the NGOs after you get the status? Uh, the NGOs have to submit an report or make any other contribution to the UN. I was wondering about the obligations after right. an NGO gets very good, and thank you that thank you for asking that question because it's something I, I, I didn't cover, but it's very important. Uh, consultative status doesn't end doesn't end when you when you when you just get it. You know, actually, it's a it's a it's a relationship, and then there is rights and, and benefits you can get, but there are also obligations. Um, the 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 obligation you have is the submission of uh, of what we call quadrennial reports. So every four years, NGOs who get consultative status, uh, they are obliged to submit a report. This report is a short report which should tell what the NGO has been doing in the last uh, four years. So it tells about, um, it has uh, some uh, defined questions already. It's not complicated, basically, if you was any change in organization of your, uh, change organizational change, in the NGO, if what are the activities you did to contribute to the UN and to contribute in particular to the SDGs, um, and uh, and I think that's pretty much it. There are two other questions, but I, I don't remember right now. Uh, 
that really define if you don't submit this application, this uh, Quadrino report every four years, you risk the possibility of first get suspended for one year, and eventually after that one year, if you still don't submit it, losing their consultative status. So, uh, so that's why it's, it's very important to, to be on top of that. Okay, I hope this answer. Uh, I'll move now to another one. Let me see. Okay, uh, I'll go one more and I, I will read a little bit more. I'll go to Bindia. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Bindia or Bindia? Bindia, you have your floor. Yes. Okay. Uh, for this particular case, I mean, I, I'm going to give you a general explanation, but probably you'll need to follow up with us in, in, in uh, through a message if you haven't done yet. Uh, the general. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot look in, in, in this webinar at the particular case because, you know, for, for the sake of time of, of, the, of, of the other uh, colleagues. Uh, yeah. However, if you send a screenshot and if you send information and they tell you, I mean, many NGOs sometimes uh, contact us because submitting the profile, which is the first part of the NGO, the, the, the application, uh, is not submitting the application. You have to submit everything and then receive an automatic e notification saying your application is submitted. That's the general question I can ask you. The, the best question would be if I actually go to your application and look exactly what happened. Uh, but this is something that, that definitely uh, my colleagues uh, can do. If you haven't, uh, uh, one thing I can recommend you to do is, I mean, uh, if you're already in contact with them, then, th then that's fine. If you want to send another message, say, say that you were already, you know, we, we discussed this in the webinar and then we can, we, we can take it from there. 